Let us pray. <clears throat> this is a prayer based on Psalm 139. And it's entitled, It's All Too Big. You are closer to me than I am, God. You shine through my chaos and confusion from my innermost self. You know my weak points and my hurt places. The habits I resort to and the goals that sustain me. You well up in me. You hold me in the palm of your hand. I can't quite grasp this is just too big. Understanding flits by in the corner of my mind and is quickly gone. You're in all of this from the Big Bang to the outer edge of space and time. You are the seed at the centre from my birth till now, to my death and beyond. Deep in every growing bone, every forming love, every struggled thought. There is nowhere that you that you that you are not. Search me, try me, purify me, lead me to the way of oneness with you. Amen. Yes, Olga. Um, on the picture, mm -hmm. I saw orange guy. Sometimes at my bedroom window, I see orange guy. Very good. And that can speak to us of a whole lot of things. There are places where we have been where maybe we have felt that's the gateway to heaven for us. And those things can sustain and nurture us. And there are other times where we lose sight of that and sometimes lose sight of where God is close to us. And we can miss that opportunity for God to be with us. The Romans reading that Les read to us talks about living by the Spirit because we are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but a spirit of adoption. It's that very spirit, it's that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If we in fact suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. And then it talks about the suffering and groaning. There are times where I suspect we all, I hope, at some stage feel that sense of the spirit enlivening us. There are other times where we feel a sense of it's the groaning and the, the struggle, particularly when something has happened. A couple of weeks ago, we had one of those pipes under the uh, vanity unit leak for half an hour, which was enough to fill one, two, three, four rooms with water and another other bits as well. After nine days of fans and dehumidifiers, they say the carpet and the, the slab is dry and they can start the restoration work. Now we've got to think about trying to fit half the house into half the house. Sorry, half the, yeah, all the house stuff into half a house so that the restoration work can, can do. There are times where you sit there and think, <sighs> when is this ever going to finish? I could identify with the groaning um, in, the, in the Romans reading. And yet 
there are times where I sit there and think, as I sit in, in my little square corner where you've got a spot for a chair to sit with furniture stacked on either side of you, we get so caught up on what we've got that sometimes when it's taken away we realise how unimportant maybe it is in the scheme of things and what is really important. There are things that we strive at that actually can enrich us and there are things that we strive at that actually take something away from us. The parable <coughs> helps us understand that. <coughs> the parable, last, uh, Dyer's sermon last week on the parable of the good soil, <coughs> I was reading a commentary that was saying that um, we often think about that as being something that... Uh, we look for the good soil, well, we recognise the good soil because when the seed is cast out, it grows, and we think about us being the sower. What about if we're the soil? Where are those times in our spots in our lives where we are the good soil? Where are the spots where we are the hard path where nothing can penetrate? There's no way I'm going to consider that. And where are those spots where the weeds grow up, where we just get crowded out? the thorny ground and rocks. The reading today, though, is about the wheat that is sown by an enemy. And the master decides to let the two grow up together. What is the parable teaching us? What is Jesus teaching us in parables, in the way that he teaches the disciples in this way. It's something we've got to keep coming back to. And one sermon on the sower is not going to necessarily give us all the answers because the whole purpose of parables is to get us thinking. So who did some good thinking about parables last week? I'm just looking. You can wave if you had some good thoughts. You might be able to hear them now, but you can... You can tell us afterwards for anyone on Zoom. Anyone had any good thoughts or some questions about parables? Die! That's good. Yes? And there's more next week. And you'll be preaching about that next week. Okay, so the answer will come next week. But this week's thought about the parables is that I was reading some commentaries around the parables and they were saying that the parables are meant to reveal the kind of transformation necessary for those who would follow Jesus to participate in the kingdom of heaven, which is his mission to effect. The parables are meant to reveal the kind of transformation necessary for those who would follow Jesus to participate in the kingdom of heaven. They're meant to leave us thinking because we don't fully comprehend how God works. Often we find it really hard to work out how we work at times, if we're honest, let alone how God might work. C.H. Dodd wrote that the parables are extended metaphors or comparisons designed to draw the the hearer into a new awareness of reality as revealed by Jesus. A new understanding, a new awareness of reality. Maybe the way we see things is not the only way and maybe there are other things that God wants us to recognise. Another person says their significance points again and again to everyday life. That, that's asked to be lived, not to be grasped by the intellect. It's asked to be lived, not grasped by the intellect. It's to get us thinking and engaging in what happens in our everyday life. So, isn't it a pity that uh, some people have weeds in with the good seed? The other day I saw Judy out picking out those pesky broadleaf stuff in the garden, in the lawn at, um, at Doreen. She had them all gone 12 months ago. Have a guess what? 
their back. They've regrouped, they've regrown, and we didn't plant them at all. Our life's a bit like that, isn't it? Because while the master says we won't, he won't pull up the weeds until the harvest, in a sense, there are weeds in our lives as well. There are parts of our lives that choke some of the life and some of the joy and presence of God out. And the parable is getting us to not only think about propagating the gospel, but also about how we live out the gospel, which is part of how Jesus propagates the gospel. And the things that hold us back and can suck away and cause us to find it more difficult to actually be aware of what God is doing as around us. Stanley Halvas, in his commentary on Matthew, is quite interesting in this regard because what he does in one part is to talk about the church in the West. So he's an American theologian. His book is more a theological commentary than a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. And he's talking about the church in the West and particularly the church in America. And what he describes is that the lure, what he, this is a quote from him, the lure of wealth and the cares of the world produced by the wealth quite simply darken and choke our imaginations. Then he says, too often those who propose strategies to recover the lost status and or the lost membership of the church do so hoping that people will, can be attracted to become members of the church without facing the demands of being a disciple of Jesus. So if we're going to be the good soil, then we need to be actually allow God to challenge us and to recognise those things that are stopping hindering God's spirit within our lives so that our soil may become deeper so that the way that we live out that presence of the spirit in our lives God's presence bears more fruit bears more of the life that Jesus is calling us to the abundant life that Jesus is calling us to He then says, it may seem odd that wealth makes it impossible to grow the word. Wealth, we assume, can create the power necessary to do much good, but wealth stills the imagination. I was thinking, you know, back, back in the past, I'm not sure what it was for Black Rock, but I know there was a whole lot of fundraising, I think, I think the similar thing here when the new church was built, a whole lot of fundraising for the building of this church when the wooden one was got beyond. Same thing at Cheltenham when the hall, the original church was needing to be updated. There was a whole program to raise money. Mentone had a whole program to, uh, to do the hall and uh, Silver, uh, Silver Street, <laughs> Herald Street had a reasonably new building that was built at some stage. And the money was raised and there was a whole lot of things done to raise the money and people got really creative to raise the money. And there was a whole lot of fellowship that happened. There was a whole lot of praying that happened, a whole lot of coming together to a common purpose. The danger is when we've got enough money to do the building, that actually we lose something of that working together to actually achieve the result and what might be done in the building. Over the time we've got before the redeveloped building is finished, maybe God's saying to us, there are things that I want you to learn. There are things in coming together as one congregation there are things about our current post-COVID context that we need to be aware of, that God is calling us to a new awareness of the future that God is calling us to. 
but we need to deepen the soil and be aware of the weeds that hold us back so that God's presence and God's spirit may grow within us so that we might encourage each other to live the life that God wants to offer to us, the life that sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot and do not fully attain because we're just not willing to allow God to challenge us to, uh, to go through that growth, the groaning and the growth to something new. May we be aware of and listen to what God is saying to us in our personal lives and our lives as a congregation. And may we be listen and see what dreaming and what God is calling us to.